We just started module two out of 10 modules this semester. And we're still look, looking into the history of cosmology, trying to understand uh, what came before Whitehead and how Whitehead understands that history, um, what he inherits from it, what he's reforming and what he's radically um, rethinking and reimagining. Um, and for some of you, this may be the first time you've read Whitehead. So I'm sure you're having difficulty with, with some of his more complex uh, sentences and uh, his new words and the you know, kind of abstract way that he's um, describing the universe sometimes, all in service, it turns out, to kind of redeeming our concrete experience and making our human consciousness and our relationship to the universe something that science needs to take seriously. So while his writing may seem really unbearably abstract and technical at times, his ultimate aim uh, is to defend the values of concrete human experience, of artistic experience, religious experience, spiritual experience. Um, so keep that in mind. And uh, I hope you'll agree with me that, um, well, you know, you kind of have to have faith that Whitehead, uh, that studying Whitehead and struggling through his difficult ideas is worth it. Because at first it might seem like, what is he even trying to say? But I guess what I want to do is promise to you that if you do stay with it and struggle, struggle to understand him, that a new perspective on the world will be revealed to you, that your perception will be altered and that you'll be able to see what it is that he's describing. I mean, Whitehead, thematizes this question and this mystery of where does order come from and where does the faith that the human mind has in the order of nature come from? Right. Uh, and we'll see that as a very, he was a very rational person, very scientific, mathematical mind, but he in the end says, well, we need to make reference to God to talk about where this order in nature comes from, right? So as much as he was wanting to hold true to the evidence of the natural sciences. He thought that that evidence actually pointed to or signified something deeper that um, the world's religions have tried to, you know, bring us into relationship with. So Whitehead's an integral thinker in the sense that he wants to take science seriously and religion because he doesn't think that we can even make sense of the universe that science is describing without these deeper religious intuitions, you know, about where the order of nature comes from, for example. Um, she raised this problem of um, how not to get lost in the weeds when studying, well, cosmology, because cosmology is in some sense the most general science that there is. And all the special sciences are supposed to be in some way harmonized within our cosmological scheme, right? And so Whitehead is attempting to construct a cosmological scheme in the middle of the 20th century or the, in the early part of the 20th century when, you know, after like a century of positivism, um, the professionalization of science so that you get this proliferation of all these dif disciplines where not only physics and chemistry and biology and psychology, but within biology, you know, there's microbiology, there's, you know, population genetics, there's evolutionary developmental biology, there's, you know, and the list goes on, right? And to do cosmology is to try to come up with a set of really general um, truths that somehow hold true across all those various disciplines. And we can't possibly study all those disciplines and know them like, uh, you know, a PhD in whatever branch would know them. So that's just a problem we're faced with as, as cosmologists, right? As people trying to come up with a, a theory of everything. Um, that's what we're talking about here. And Whitehead's a very humble person. You know, he says, philosophy begins in wonder and at the end, if philosophy has done its job well, the wonder remains. So he's not trying to explain everything with some simple uh, equation. He's attempting to 
tell a story, a likely story, as Plato would put it, that allows us to justify what we call civilized human life. A story that situates us as human beings well enough that we can continue to go on um, enjoying our existence and contributing to the flourishing of the planet that we find ourselves on. Um, so, you know, I have to be honest, as we move forward in the course, there are going to be some modules, like I think module six and seven, where in module six, we're taking on all of evolutionary theory and all of complexity theory and what Whitehead can contribute to those huge, you know, fields of inquiry. And then module seven, we're looking at relativity theory and quantum theory, which are each so um, fraught with paradox and disagreement among physicists about what's really the case. So there are so many weeds to explore, um, so many trees to look at uh, in that forest. And all we can do in this course is offer a broad overview of what Whitehead had to say about these fields. And, you know, I would say at the end of this semester, there are going to be certain questions, specific questions that really haunt you. And you're going to want to go examine those in more detail. You know, maybe your paper will be, your final paper will be an examination of one of those details. Um, but the curriculum I've tried to design just gives you sort of Whitehead's view of each of these things, you know, and we're not going to be able to cover even a fraction of uh, the ingredients of, of, of contemporary cosmology, you know. Um, so I admit defeat right, right up front on that, on that count. <laughs> so Whitehead says something about God that I find really important to consider right up front, which is that um, he says in his book, Process and Reality, that um, the concept of God and of God's function in the world right. is the most important thing for contemporary philosophers to try to secularize, he says. Right. So in other words, he wants to find a way of talking about God in a secular context mm -hmm. so that we understand that as a concept, and, and that doesn't mean that God might not be a person, right. but as a concept, when we're thinking philosophically, right. there's a function for God to play in the world, right. the world that science has described to us. Whitehead thinks that world as described by science it doesn't make sense without God playing some role. Right. So his philosophy is an attempt to describe what that role is. And he also makes comments about how often the emotions associated with certain religious belief systems can get in the way of philosophy. Right. Um, and he points to um, the history of biblical religions, um, Judaism, um, Christianity and also Islam, um, religions of the book, that there's been a tendency for the need for a kind of divine dictator or cosmic father, right. the emotional need for that, that has, Whitehead thinks, distorted metaphysics. That's, that that emotion, that that need for a, a, a parental mm -hmm. type of God has had a, a, a bad influence on philosophy and that he's trying to conceive of God in a way that doesn't fall victim to that emotional need for that type of God. Now, Whitehead also says things about um, the way that Christianity personalizes God and, and mm -hmm. God in the person of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And he thinks that this is a kind of um, an important moment in the history of religious expression and belief uh, where the divine was identified with the human being. Mm -hmm. And so to the question, who are we really? You know, Whitehead's idea or concept of God is an attempt to bring us into touch, 
yeah, with the function that God plays in the world, but also into touch with who we really are yeah. as human beings and who we really are as human beings in Whitehead's view, I would say is that being which is capable of participating in the divine, which is conscious of God's function in the universe. Um, you know, Whitehead is often called a pan n theist. So he's not just a pantheist who identifies God in the world and says nature and divinity are just the same thing. He believes that God permeates the world, but that there is something to God that's not simply identical to the world. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, so then while the whole universe is divine in some sense, the whole universe is an expression of divine power in some sense. Um, there's something about the human being and human consciousness that at its best, when it is most um, deeply and intimately intuiting the nature of existence and of the universe, there's something about human consciousness that makes it divine. Yep. Um, and yeah, I think that's how Whitehead would look at these questions that you're asking. Um, you asked also about space-time and, uh, you know, Whitehead thinks that, you know, space and time are the, the, the kind of um, soul and body of God in a way. Right. Right. Space right. is God's body, time is God's soul. Really, it's space-time. They're not separate, just like the soul and the body are not separate. Right. Um, and when we contemplate the nature of space-time, we're trying to contemplate the divine nature. Um, so that's how Whitehead looks at these questions, and, and we're definitely going to explore in more detail as we go on this semester how, you know, that definition or that understanding of space-time cashes out in the context of, like, relativity theory and Big Bang cosmology and all of this. Um, but that's sort of a a teaser for you. You know, you and I have already spoken a bit um, mm -hmm. about some of the books and, and dissertations that have been written comparing white ed to various aspects of Eastern thought, whether it's Sri Aurobindo, um, different uh, schools of Buddhist thought. Um, and so the first thing I want to say, though, about that East-West crossover is that Whitehead was a, a product of his time and there was a lot of just colonialist assumptions in the scholarship in the first part of the, still in the first part of the 20th century. Yeah, and you may have heard echoes of that in, in the first couple chapters of Science in the Modern World, um, where Whitehead's making assumptions about the sort of um, anti-rational, the anti-rationalistic understanding of God and, and Mm -hmm. uh, Vedic religions and so on, um, which we know now is not true. You know, he just didn't have access to the full breadth of um, scholarship that was um, extant in 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 the the Asian world when he was writing this in the 1920s yep, yep, yep. in England. Um, he does say in in his book uh, Religion and Religion in the Making. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a short little book. We're going to read part of it this semester, but not the part about the evolution of religion, uh, where, so Whitehead wrote this the year after he wrote Science and the Modern World, and he, in here he talks about Christianity and Buddhism as something like um, the most, the most rational religions, and by rational he doesn't mean um, what we might normally think of that. I almost think that rational in the CIS context has like a negative connotation. <laughs> um, what, what he means by rational is the sense of like, as I was describing earlier, the purification of emotion, the intensification of emotion that's associated with ritual, that's associated with symbolism and the raising of that emotion to, to the level of clear um, metaphysical insight into the nature of reality mm -hmm. and he thinks 
based on what he was exposed to that Christianity and Buddhism do this with, within this uh, um, a particular force, right? And I think he, you can read his reasons why he says that, um, you know, in, in religion in the making, but I really think if he were exposed to more of the world's literature, um, particularly from, from India, um, Japan, China, uh, and all of, you know, Asia, and, you know, he also has some um, prejudices against uh, Islam that really could be corrected by more study if he were able to digest the scholarship that we have available today. I think he would expand his understanding beyond just Christianity and Buddhism to include more of the world's religious traditions. Um, so there's work to be done, I think, to take Whitehead's understanding of God's function in the universe, to take that and compare it to what, you know, Asian thinkers have been saying for millennia. Um, there's a lot of, I think, convergence there, way more than Whitehead even realized that he was quite aware of that convergence, even with the little that he did know. You know, he says in Process and Reality that his process relational ontology has more in common with certain Vedic and Buddhist strains of thinking than it does with the biblical traditions. Right, right. So, yeah, I think that's what I would say in general about Whitehead and the East-West nexus. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of exciting work to be done there. So I hope you'll engage in some of that. <laughs> you know, uh, Plato, as he um, expresses through his, he expresses it in mythic form with the allegory of the cave and, and in other dialogues more conceptually and logically, he has this theory of ideas or of forms. Mm -hmm. And in Plato's um, uh, philosophy, the forms are what's really real. And the world of our sensory experience, of our embodied experience, is in some way um, a poor imitation of that realm of forms. And that, you know, there's a form, um, a form that participates in every particular that is the most perfect form of that particular. So there's, you know, there's a divine um, idea of a water bottle in heaven somewhere. This would be a kind of gross caricature. Um, there's a divine idea of a water bottle in heaven somewhere and all particular water, water bottles per participate in that divine form imperfectly um, to some degree or another. And especially beautiful water bottles are like, a little bit closer to the divine idea. And mm -hmm. so we experience them as more beautiful because of that proximity to the idea. You know, in Plato, beauty is this interesting um, amphibious idea hmm. uh, because in some, ways it it, it, in some ways it participates in the realm of appearances. When we're talking about something beautiful, we're talking about something that appears. It's not an invisible form or a totally invisible form. Uh, and so beauty kind of straddles the eternal and the temporal or the realm of being and the realm of becoming in a way that none of Plato's other ideas does. So, and, and Whitehead exploits that in his okay. own philosophy. But Whitehead's turning Plato on his head in the sense that rather than seeing the forms as the preeminent realities, mm -hmm. Whitehead wants to see the realm of becoming and experience of concrete uh, experience as what's really real. And, you know, like Plato, he still has a realm of forms. He calls them eternal objects. Mm -hmm. But for him, these are merely potentials. And what process, what creativity is really after is not just potential, but actualization. And really? so for Whitehead, it's actualization in embodied uh, experience that is what the universe is after, is what um, is what is really real at the end of the day. Whereas the forms are kind of the, um, they're necessary ingredients in the process of actualization, mm -hmm. but they are themselves, Whitehead says, deficient in actuality. So rather than like Plato seeing the forms as these, um, you know, sources of, of all being, for Whitehead, 
they're deficient in being. And our lived experience puts us in touch with, with reality. Uh, so you could say, you know, Whitehead wants us to go deeper into the cave. Plato wants us to escape the cave. Whitehead doesn't think there is any escape, not even, not even for God. You know, God is, um, you know, a shadow worker in a sense. And right. playing, playing with shadows is what the divine does. Uh, and that we could, the idea that we could unveil the last veil and get to the pure eternal, you know, form mm. is, you know, for Whitehead, the opposite of what the pursuit of philosophical understanding should be. You know, we need to understand more the patterns that the veils and the shadows uh, are expressing and that truth is in recognition of those patterns rather than in something behind those appearances. We'll see how this notion that um, time is tensed, time has past and future and present ingredients, that each moment of time has past, future and, and present, um, which is stands in contrast, that view of time stands in contrast to the Einsteinian uh, notion. And quantum theory is no different than relativity on this, that really the future and the past are indistinguishable from one another. The equations of physics, right, right, right. talking about relativity or quantum theory, they work just as well in either direction. So from the perspective of physics, yeah. time is reversible. Yeah, yeah. Whitehead says that's because of the abstraction. That's because of the abstract way that physics is looking at time and that metaphysically real time requires a sense of a past that is ontologically different from the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the sense that the future is potential, the past is already actual and the present is the meeting place, the tension that's, uh, continuously created at the intersection or the meeting place of past and future. Hmm. And so Whitehead's whole ontology is based on a description of that eternal present as a meeting place between the past and the future wow. and repetition of what's achieved in that present. Um, and this is what he means. What I'm describing is what he means by concrescence. Uh. If we can, you know, by the end of the semester, if we understand what Whitehead means by concrescence, that one idea, the whole rest of his cosmology falls into place. Mm -hmm. um, the universe is an achievement of uh, an infinite multitude of concressing occasions of experience, right? Um, and yeah, the role that ideas play in that experience is to lure us Mm. towards certain futures um yeah and they and, you know they have other roles to play but that's the most important one and that's a good way of thinking about how plato reverses whitehead reverses plato rather than thinking of ideas as our origin right. ideas are kind of what's drawing us forward yeah in um the the text that I wrote that I've assigned this semester, there's I have a chapter on that's called Whitehead's um, what is it the generalization the imaginative generalization of evolutionary theory, where I show how Whitehead basically takes Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection and generalizes it so that it applies at every scale of sure, sure, sure. the cosmos. There's a, a sense in which, you know, biologically we talk about um, uh, reproduction and the inheritance of mutations in each generation. And Whitehead thinks of ontology in the same way as these moments um, of experience that kind of repeat the past, but with a difference of a little creative, you know, interpretation thrown in with each reproduction of the past. And that can produce, it's the same sort of evolutionary algorithm that Darwin's describing at the biological level. Whitehead's just generalizing it to say, this is how all the universe 
operates as it moves forward in time through these processes of creative reproduction, uh, inheritance of the past, but with a slight difference that then gets kind of selected by an environment. So his universe is fully evolutionary. Yeah, from top to bottom. Yes, and there's, there's a lot of contingency in there too. So these ideas, these beautiful forms that we're moving toward, they're, they're adapting to the decisions that creatures make in the present. Um, we don't have to decide to realize the most beautiful um, idea in each moment. Uh, sometimes our vision is clouded and we, we realize something that you know, degrades the capacity that we have or that our environment has to realize beauty. Yeah. And the evolutionary adventure is in that sense, not predetermined. It's not necessarily going to climax in this wonderful um, moment of providence, right? It could, mm -hmm. but there's also, you know, there's, there's freedom in the sense that each individual can decide whether or not it's going to go in that direction. Um, so there's contingency in Whitehead's evolutionary picture. It's not like Tehar de Chardin, where the omega point is a foregone conclusion and right. everything is going to converge on that no matter what. You know, Whitehead's a teleological or he's a, he's a thinker of purposes at the cosmic scale, but not as necessary purposes but as contingent they could be realized that there's there's real drama in whitehead's universe and whitehead's understanding of evolution we don't know what the final result of all this is going to be um you know there's there's a lot of tragedy there's room for tragedy in whitehead's view of evolution despite the fact that it's driven by purposes and ideals um and despite the fact that if we do look at the history of our universe, it would appear that there's been the achievement of more harmony than chaos, right? Mm -hmm. The universe could be way more chaotic than it is. There's still some chaos going on, but clearly some order has been achieved that's astoundingly beautiful, right? So we have good reason to believe maybe we can continue on this trajectory, but we can't be sure. I don't think you're wrong at all. It's a it's a deep intuition that this idea that we came from order and that this process of becoming can only, in a sense, move away from that and produce more chaos. I think it's important to remember that when we talk about order and chaos, we're talking about abstractions and that what's actually real and concrete is some mix of order and chaos. You never get pure chaos. You never get pure order. And so on some level, it's kind of, um, it's almost arbitrary whether we say we started in, in chaos or we started in order, because if we started in chaos, well then there's gotta be some little bit of order in there somewhere or else where did we come from? And, or if we started in pure order, there's gotta be some room for improvisation or, you know, change in, in pure order. Otherwise, why would anything have happened at all? It was already perfect. So there's a way in which we can get confused by our own uh, abstractions. And, you know, while I was just saying that Whitehead privileges becoming over being, uh, there's another way in which he acknowledges that these are both necessary ingredients that we think in terms of these two big abstractions. And if we try to eliminate one by reduction to the other, we're gonna be doing violence to some real aspect of, of the universe. So, you know, the way you're thinking about it is the other side of the coin to how I've been describing it, you know? Right. And I think we need to stay in that tension uh, if we wanna stay true to reality, which is always gonna be more than our abstractions can fully grasp. But philosophy is the search for that, you know, scheme of abstractions or words and concepts that allows us to gently um, kind of hold these, these polarities without violently reducing one to the other. Higher, let me see. Oh yeah, there we go. 
womb world, physical world, spiritual world. That's, yeah, that's fascinating. I like the way you've uh, named that, that sequence. Um, I think, so Whitehead does have, in my understanding, uh, concepts that can map on to what you've called womb world. You know, in terms of the womb world, it's like where we came from before we were born. Right. In this life. Whitehead has a sense of the past mm -hmm. as um, uh, the past is present. The past is active in the present. The past is inherited by the present. And each of us is in a sense, um, gifted our own sense of orientation by, by the past. Mm -hmm. And the past is, is for Whitehead, um, an accumulation of experiences mm -hmm. that have perished. But in perishing, those past experiences have gifted themselves to us here in the present. Mm -hmm. And through that gift, they become immortal. So Whitehead will talk about perished experience as having some immortality. Mm -hmm. Because in each moment of our experience now, we're resurrecting, we're, we're breathing new life into those past experiences. Right. And so in some sense, the whole past of, you know, our own lives back to birth, but even of our parents lives back to their births and of our whole species history and of the history of all life on earth the history of our solar system and back and back as far as we can trace it there is an inheritance of experience and you know for whitehead there's human experience and there's animal experience and plant experience and molecular experience atomic experience Whitehead would say that there's some sort of experience associated with stars. There's something it's like mm -hmm. to be a star. It's nothing like human experience, but it's experience of some kind. The entire past of the universe through all these different stages of its evolution is inherited by us. And so I'm kind of thinking of that past as the womb world right. that we come out of. And just as those past experiences are given immortality in the present through our experience of them, through our inheritance of them, we too will perish. Right. And then gift our own experience to the future. Mm -hmm. And that's the spiritual world for Whitehead. He leaves open the question of whether we have personal immortality, mm -hmm. but whether or not my own sense of individual egoic consciousness somehow survives my, my death. Right. Whitehead still says, you know, that's an open question, but regardless of that, Whitehead still says that all of my accumulated experience in my life is being passed on when I die to the next generation of human beings and to the rest of the universe in its evolutionary adventure. And so in that way, the spiritual world isn't another place out there. It's the future of this world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? right? So... Uh, that's kind of how I would map on what you've described to Whitehead's view of the universe. Whitehead probably would not accept the view that uh, on some level individuals have failed to prepare for this life in some way and that's the reason for a handicap or a disability. I don't think Whitehead would look at it that way because um, I'm talking in terms of spirituality, spiritual things, spirituality, not just like physical or cosmological. Uh, uh, uh. In so terms of the inner man. Right. So again, Whitehead doesn't rule out the possibility of um, a kind of karmic inheritance. You know? uh, but he, and this is a paradox in, in Buddhist thought too. Oops, sorry. Um, this is a paradox in Buddhist thought, too, where there's this notion of karmic inheritance. Sorry, guys, someone's trying to call me here. Um, there's this notion of inheritance in Buddhism, and yet 
there's no self either. And so what is it exactly that's being reborn um, through the process of reincarnation? And I think, you know, Whitehead's going to ask us to, to deal with a similar um, uh, question in that, you know, while we are inhabiting this individual organism in this particular life, mm -hmm. it's not clear that the consciousness that we have pre-existed our bodies and it's not clear that it will continue on in the form that we know it as our own personal identity after this body perishes. Um, Whitehead leaves open the possibility of that, but it's not required. It's not built into his, his metaphysics or his cosmology that that takes place. What is inherited are, you know, the experiences that we have. And in some sense, you know, as a human being, my humanness includes potentially the experience of every other human being. Right. And we're all in this together in that sense. Right. Um, and at a non-human level, you know, my body is composed of a society of cells. And each of those cells has its own inner experience of itself. And miraculously, all of these trillions of cells coordinate themselves so as to give rise to my human body. And all my neurons coordinate to give rise to my personal identity and my stream of consciousness and my sense of who I am. And it's not clear to me, and, it, and here I'm thinking with Whitehead, that this complex, intricate coordination um, will be available after my body decomposes in order to continue to host what we call, what I call my soul or what I call my, my, my person, my identity. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think Whitehead would say, all we can say for sure is that we will live on in the memories of others who continue to remember us. Um, and that relative to my existence now, that living on in other people's memory is the spiritual world for me. Mm -hmm. um, and that may seem like a deflationary view relative to um, other religious perspectives on this. Um, and I think Whitehead still wants to leave open the possibility of something more like personal immortality. But again, if you think about it in the terms of his ontology, what I've described is the, is the most we can be sure of. Right. And, uh, you know, in regard to what you're saying about death as a person's um, merging with something greater than themselves and that we use a parental image to comfort ourselves, to think about what that greater, something greater than ourselves might be. Mm -hmm. Whitehead has, as we'll see, uh, his understanding of God is has two sides to it, two poles, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, there's the primordial nature of God, and there's a consequent nature of God. And the reason Whitehead thought that we needed these two poles is that um, the the primordial nature is sort of a cosmological principle. It's it's what allows us to understand why the universe has become organized in the way that it has, that there was this initial, um, you know, this, this lure that the divine gave to the process of physical evolution that allowed it to come into the complex forms of order that it has. That's the primordial nature of God, the lure that guides the evolutionary process towards complexity. The consequent nature of God isn't a cosmological principle, it's more anthropological. Yeah. It's a hope that human beings have that the universe is divinely inhabited and that everything that happens, every person who dies will be remembered mm -hmm. by God. Mm -hmm. We don't know for sure that that's true. Right. It seems to be built into our nature to believe it. Mm -hmm. um, and even those who are fervent atheists are emotionally reacting, reacting against an inbuilt instinct to believe in that. And 
I almost see atheism as a emotional reaction to the lack of certainty about like an like an angry like people get angry that they can't be sure that that's what's going to happen when we die or that that kind of god exists and so we're really mad about it like why can't we just know for sure mm -hmm. so the reaction is to reject the whole thing and just <laughs> move forward <laughs> pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps and pretend like it doesn't matter but there's still that deep yearning for something like that um, so the consequent nature of God is a reflection of human nature and this religious need for something more. The primordial nature of God is just this cosmological principle that helps us make sense of the universe as we see it, right? right. There's one, one God for Whitehead with these two sides to it. He, you know, Whitehead was um, a brilliant mathematician and mathematical physicist and philosopher, but he was also an educator and he did as much administration at the universities that he worked at as he did teaching and research. And he wrote a lot about um, pedagogy and about what the role of the university was in society. And so I think he would say that um, these ideas need to be communicated in the context of a university education and that universities should be um, in the business of preparing human beings to inhabit the universe. He, he said that the university is where we imagine the future. So there's a dual role there for the, the university um, to learn how to inhabit the universe, but also to imagine the future. Um, so in other words, in, at in, a, in the educational process, we need to both inherit the habits that have constituted human existence for thousands of years, right? Pythagoras was figuring out the geometrical uh, uh, and mathematical basis for music and architecture and nature, uh, organic physical nature, two, two and a half thousand years ago, you know? And we need to learn how he knew that and his methods it's not like we, um, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants, right? So there's a lot of, there's a lot of habit that is worth habituating to. At the same time that we don't want to get so stuck in, um, you know, the weight of the past that we're unable to uh, creatively reinterpret what we think is possible and to imagine a new world. And I think, Ideally, that's what we would do in the context of a university. You know, there would be a faculty that would teach history in the broadest sense, the collective achievement of the human species across all continents. And then there would also be the teaching of creative method, which is to say, given what you've learned about the past, how can it be applied to our present circumstances? And how can it be how can it inspire us to bring forth a better world? Because, you know, Whitehead saw the universe as a creative process uh, and civilization as part of the universe is also then a creative process. And there are periods of, um, you know, rise of civilization and collapse of civilization. We're probably in a decadent phase of civilization right now. Collapse seems to be upon us. Um, that's what happens. And luckily, you know, there have been plenty of collapses before that separate our time from Pythagoras's time, but we still know about Pythagoras. So even as civilizations rise and fall, there's an inheritance of the collective human, of the wisdom of, of humanity, right? Uh, and so, you know, in Whitehead's view, I think there's, again, this tension between inheriting that past and imagining what futures it makes possible for us. And, you know, as someone who was steeped in mathematics and science as, as an undergraduate, as a student, he felt really strongly that scientists and engineers and technologists and programmers, uh, well, you know, today we call programmers, they really, um, they need to be exposed to Shakespeare and, and, to philosophy, you know, literature and the history of science in, in a way that they're just not 
in most cases. And this was already happening 100 years ago when white ed was a professor. It's only gotten worse today where you can get a doctoral degree in whatever branch of you know, astrophysics and have no understanding of uh, you know, literature or art or philosophy. And similarly, you can get an advanced degree in philosophy and have no understanding of physics. Uh, these are both problems. So, you know, Whitehead's view of creativity is that it's not that it's just always good. Also, it's important to say that sometimes creativity in the wrong season or in the wrong habitat can be destructive. It can undermine the habits that have sustained uh, a certain habitat. Yeah. Right? So you, we always need to consider how do we get to that future that's better than the present from where we are with, without making it worse in an attempt to do so, right? Um, so yeah, these are all things that Whitehead would wanna to toss into the, the sorts of questions that you're, you're asking. If you're reading Whitehead closely, you should be experiencing some discomfort <laughs> because he's disrupting our common sense, which in the, 21st century after several centuries of mechanistic thinking our common sense has become mechanical yeah. and our understanding of science has become a view of it as though science is about um, certain producing certain knowledge of an objective physical world objective because it's separate from us as as mental creatures um, and what Whitehead's saying is that these categories of mind and matter, too abstract. What's really going on is this circulation of process. And in our experience of that process, there are certain mental aspects and certain physical aspects, but they're not two separate types of reality. They're the same process. Uh, and to get a handle on how we're going to start talking about the physical world, as well as how we're going to start talking about the psychological world in the context of that kind of process, um, it's going to take some practice. We, we need to learn a new language. Mm. And it's going to be difficult at first, just like, you know, when we learned uh, as infants, when we learn to speak, uh, we have to learn a new grammar. We have to learn how words fit together in a meaningful way. And the fact that a, a child can learn to speak English or whatever other language with this complex grammar, it's really amazing that it, at some point, this understanding emerges, you know? Mm -hmm. The same thing happens with Whitehead's language. You reach a point where all of a sudden you begin to perceive the world in the terms that he's describing it. And all of a sudden you're not inhabiting that Newtonian universe anymore. And that process is ongoing for me, right? I've been studying his ideas for 10 years and I'm continuing to take more steps into that white heady universe, that organic universe. Um, and my perception is still being tweaked and altered as I continue to study Whitehead's thought and ask questions. There's plenty of Whitehead's thought that remains obscure to me. Um, and I'm, but I'm, I have enough faith in Whitehead as a thinker to know that if I struggle to understand, it will reward me because I've had that experience enough with many of his ideas.